Hello and welcome to the Sports Show Podcast, your bite-sized guide to enter the sports industry. Joining me in the studio, as always, is the voice of sports grad, Ruben Williams. How are you, mate? G'day, Ryan. How are you, mate? I'm doing very well, thank you. I'm extremely excited for this episode in particular because we are talking to the voice of Australian football. Now, mm. you know me very well. You know that I rant and rave all the time about Australia's match against Uruguay in 2005 at Stadium oh, yeah. Australia where the Socceroos qualified for the FIFA World Cup for the first time in 32 years. Now, I was there, Ryan, as an 11-year-old boy, and that was kind of my spark to wanting to work in sports. Yeah. And today, we get to talk to the man who commentated that iconic moment in Australian sporting history. It's a, it's a massive episode. It's, mm. it's right up there in the archive, I would have thought. Absolutely. In terms of big sporting moments, this is... Uh, this is right up there. 100%. Yeah. I can't wait to get into it. It's very exciting. So let's get cracking. If you want to learn more about who we are, feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. Or if you want to ask us any questions, jump into the Sports Grad community, which is flying at the moment. Yes. And a quick shout out to one of our Sports Grad community members, Sam Hickson, signed up the other day. Now, Sam is an event coordinator at Football Australia. Timely. He's going to be at the match on Thursday night between Australia and Japan, helping mm. just to coordinate everything that goes on on the pitch and off the pitch as well. But Sam signed up to our community and he left us this great note. He said, I realized that while I was sitting comfortable in my sports job, other people were getting ahead of me. I decided to join sports grads so that I can further myself professionally, learn from the best in sport and grow my professional network. So if you like Sam and you're working in sport, Sports grad community is not just for grads and students who want to get into the industry or for decision makers who want to hire people quickly. It's for that middle rung as well who are really looking to develop. So if you want to get involved, head to the link in our show notes and jump in. Fantastic, Rude. Before we get cracking, if you're currently studying or you've just finished studying, having a postgrad qualification in sports management on your resume can give you a huge leg up over potential candidates applying for the same role. If you want to pump up your resume and get specialised knowledge in all areas of sport, take a look at Deakin's postgrad qualifications. Their Master of Business in Sports Management, sports management is not one of, but the best one in Australia, ranked at number one. So add a postgrad to your resume, and that's our tip for the episode. Now, Ryan, I mentioned the voice of Australian football earlier. His name is Simon Hill. He's a northern Englishman from Manchester, believe it or not, who made his way over to Australia and joined the SBS network in 2002 and was actually one of the uh, broadcasters for the 2005 Ashes series, back when yeah. SBS used to broadcast the Ashes, which turned out to be one of the most uh, enthralling Ashes series of all time. Mm -hmm. But Simon then went on to become well-known for his coverage of football in Australia and his work for SBS, Fox Sports, Channel 10 these days, covering the biggest moments and matches such as the World Cup qualifiers, the FIFA World Cup when Australia has made it, the A-League as well. And one of those matches that he covered just happened to be the match where Australia qualified for the World Cup for the first time in 32 years. And so one of my favourite things about this chat, Ryan, is that as the man who, who captured the moment, he gave us his full insight as to what it meant to him, how he prepared for it and mm. his experience on the night. I loved it. It was absolutely brilliant. Didn't know all the backstory to it, which was quite, quite interesting to hear. Yeah. Um, Fresh off the plan from Uruguay, from Montevideo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah unreal. So uh, that was great to hear. But also just hearing the, the elements of commentating a football game, you know, and the, the different, you know, it's different to an AFL game, it's different to cricket, it's different to any other sport. Uh, it was just really cool to hear how, you know, the ebbs and flows of a game comes into it. So mm. really interesting. Yeah, and for those who are keen on commentary, it'd be, it'd be interesting to c compare Simon's notes to uh, Hamish McLaughlin's notes. If, you are, if you're looking to get into media, dive back into episode 124 after this and just get a, a take for commentating mm. across football, uh, two codes of football. Um, but then Simon is also extremely smart and well-read and has got some great opinions on football and how it can be uh, better in Australia in particular. And so to hear some of his thoughts on how administrators can grow the game of football, 
here on Australian soil was really interesting to hear. And I think for those who want to step into the industry or already working in the industry, he's got some interesting points that are well worth yeah. considering. Yeah, absolutely. It's a cracker chat. Grab a pen because this is epic. Enjoy this chat with Simon Hill. Simon, welcome to the Sports Grad Podcast. Nice to be with you guys. How are you? Very well. Thank you, Simon. It's a pleasure to have you on. I want to start the episode just by taking you back uh, 17 years to see if you remember this. That means <laughs> that if John Aloisi can score this goal, Australia will be there. Are you sure? Trying to do one that's four, two, hardly, four, two. He wins it for us, John. Here's Aloisi for a place in the he World Cup. Yeah! Australia have done it. John! Come on, John Aloisi, the Confederations John Cup hero, has done it in the biggest game of all. That, of course, is John Aloisi sending Australia to the World Cup finals for the first time in in 32 years. Simon, you, you called that moment for everyone around Australia, but for you as an Englishman coming from Manchester, what does that moment mean to you? This is a question I've been asked an awful lot. <laughs> um, it's probably the question I get asked most of all, and uh, it's an answer that not many people expect. Uh, the moment itself, in terms of the football, is fantastic. Uh, loved it. You know, I'd only been in Australia 18 months at that point, and to be involved in something so special it was terrific. Um, professionally, that night was awful. <laughs> <laughs> it was a mess. Uh, and, you know, largely because obviously Fozzie was you know, very emotionally invested in the result, and um, I had completely understood that. And Fozzie and I have spoken about this, <clears throat> excuse me, many times since, and laughed about it afterwards. Um, but it was it was very difficult uh, to do my job properly. <laughs> and I don't look back on that game with any fondness from a professional point of view. Uh, so every time I hear that commentary, which I must have heard, goodness knows, a thousand times, <laughs> um, you know, I cringe really. But, you know, you only get one shot at it. And as, it, as I've said many times as well, you know, the way things have turned out, because Australia won, and this is a good lesson for sports commentators, and it was for me at the time as well, uh, I, I went home that night thinking we're going to get smashed for that call because that was bad. Um, but as it turned really? out, nobody cared because Australia won. It's not <laughs> yeah. that It's about what happens on the field. So, you know, that, that's a good little lesson, and um, people have remembered it fondly and in the right way, which is nice. Um but yeah, there, there are, you know, the cause of the World Cup in 2006, in my opinion, <laughs> far better. But, uh, you know, obviously it's iconic um, because it meant so much to the country and I get that. So it's, it's nice to be involved in. But if I never had to hear that piece of commentary, <laughs> I'd be quite happy. <laughs> so we'll probably oh, open the yeah. podcast yeah. in the worst <laughs> possible way. <laughs> <laughs> we should have got. You know, it's funny because. It, everybody thinks that because it's their favourite memory, it's all yeah. mine, you know, um, and that's not necessarily the case. But it's for different reasons. It's not for pure sporting reasons. It's it's because as a professional, you know, when these moments come along, they're quite rare, and you know that they're going to be replayed for twenty years afterwards. Yeah. And they are. Yeah. Um, mm. So you know, I've got to listen to that every time and think, oh, God, here we go again. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's it's nice to be mm. with it. Well, you had another great call uh, the following year mm. at the World Cup finals where Tim Cahill scored his second goal and it was Cahill, Cahill, Tim Cahill has done it again. And all of a sudden, within a couple of years of broadcasting on SBS, you were the, the voice of Australian football. And I suppose for commentators, it's almost your job to kind of add meaning to, to what people are, are seeing on screen. And for a lot of people uh, who grew up watching the Socceroos and myself in particular, you kind of added meaning and made Australia... Uh, um, helped us appreciate what was happening in front of us. And I know personally for myself, that inspired me to kind of go on and uh, follow Socceroos for a long, long time to the FIFA World Cup in 2018 in Russia. Uh, but for myself and my dad and my family, the Socceroos was, was like that one sporting team that kind of brought us all together. And so I guess, you know, uh, it's those moments that even though professionally it might not have been as planned for you, for the people of Australia and the people who are kind of connecting at home, uh, it was a wonderful call that kind of brought us all together for those moments. 
Well, first of all, thank you. That, that's a really nice thing to hear. Um, you know, if if uh, if I'm, when I you know give this gig up in the next <laughs> few years, not quite yet. You know, it's it's nice to think that people have been uh, impacted at least a little bit by some of your work. Of course, it's not mainly about me; it's about what happens on the pitch. But you know, we do have a role to play, and uh, I really appreciate that those sentiments. And you know, really, in many ways. I've been the luckiest guy in the world because, you know, I'm a working class kid from Manchester. You can tell by the, you know, Man City top on, even though we've got bucket loads of money these days. Um, And, you know, I came to Australia in 2003 really with no great expectations of doing any of that stuff. Um, You know, my, my gig initially was to work on the world game and report on Toyota World Sports. And I just, you know, fortunately coincided my arrival with... Uh, the kickstart of the game in this country and those World Cup qualifications and the start of the A-League and the move to Asia and then the Asian Cup win. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to be selected by SBS and, and then Fox Sports and now, of course, Channel 10 uh, to be, you know, their the, the caller for some of those iconic moments. So, you know, you, you're, as a broadcaster, in large part at, at, uh, at the behest of where the rights go and whether you know, people at the networks who have the rights like you as a broadcaster or not. It's a very subjective industry. Mm. Um, and, you know, in many ways, I'd, I've got lucky that, uh, you know, people seem to like me at the right times. And, um, you know, I, I got to call some of those fantastic moments. So if it did all end tomorrow, you know, even though I wouldn't be very pleased, let me tell you, <laughs> uh, to go, but, uh you know, I, I couldn't really have any complaints. I've, I've done everything I wanted to and more besides. It's It's been an incredible journey and it's, you know, it's all thanks to football. I love that. Yeah, Simon, what my first, uh, you know, when I first saw you on TV was waking up at 2 a.m. over in Perth to watch the Premier League because the time zone was so bad. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we, we, we both, uh, both have our fond memories of you, which is great. But um, as Ruben said, you are the voice of Australian football. How did you learn to commentate play on play? And did you go through any specific training to, to get to where you are? It's a good question, actually. Uh, look, I, I was a trained journalist, I'm a trained journalist. Um, you know, I did that very early on in my, well, even before my career started, really, in the, in the UK. Uh, and started learning through, you know, hands-on experience of broadcasting at local radio stations in England. In fact, first of all, in South Wales for a, a radio station called Red Dragon FM in, in Cardiff. That was my very first job. Uh, but even before that, when I was uh, studying and, and doing the, the course in, in journalism in Portsmouth on the South Coast, I was writing match reports uh, for the Portsmouth youth team in the old Southeast Counties combination, travelling away with the team and uh, getting paid five pounds per match report and the fish and chip lunch, and that was it. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I learnt um, from from doing as much as anything else in a practical sense because uh, when I came through the system, which was the early nineties, uh, essentially my, my training course was in written journalism. I, I wanted to write. I had no real interest in broadcasting. Um, but at uh, the time I came out of, uh, you know, my college, there weren't many jobs in written journalism. There was a big recession on in the UK. And I applied to a local radio station, Red Dragon FM in Cardiff, uh, for a job in commercial production writing, which is essentially, you know, scripting adverts for the radio station, because I thought that was the closest I could get at that particular time. Uh, and they got back to me and said, look, we don't think you're suitable for this, but there's a job here as a sports reporter. We see that you've got some you know, experience in sport and that you love it. And so, you know, my career path changed quite early on. In terms of, of commentary, that started in radio as well. Um, did I have any formal training? No. Um, I mean, I, I had training in broadcasting, but not in calling a game. Uh, I don't know whether you can be trained. I mean, you can, you know, be given advice and offered tips. Uh, but essentially, I was chucked in at the deep end by my then producer at BBC Radio Lancashire in 1993, a bloke called Guy Havard, who, strangely enough, I just exchanged texts with today. He's, he's a big <laughs> arsehole. Um, and uh, he, he said to me at the start of the 93-94 season, okay, uh, I'm going to host the show on Saturday and you're going to go out and do 
a full match commentary on Chelsea against Blackburn Rovers. Talk about being dropped in at the deep end. That was wow. Jeez. live call at Stamford Bridge. And I said, oh, okay. And I'd sort of done bits, you know, I'd experimented a bit. Uh, and I said, you know, I haven't, I haven't really done full match commentary. And he said, well, let's find out if you can do it. So, uh, I, you know, that's where I started. And here I am 30 years later and I'm, I'm still doing it. So I, I must have done something, okay, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was... You know, my, my path was a little bit unconventional in some ways. Conventional in in the fact that I, I, you know, I trained as a journalist, but in terms of being an actual on-air broadcaster and a commentator of football games, um, that was more sort of learning on the job. And you know, I hope that obviously down the years, you know, I'll, I'll become a bit better at it. There, there's still you know games I, I watch a lot of my games back and think, oh, that was awful or you know you should have said this or that was too predictable or you got that wrong you know we're, we're all uh, every every commentator will tell you the same and i you know i know that the big commentators in the uk at the moment who you'll be aware of the names the likes of peter drury and john champion and steve wilson and guy mowbray you know that these are all friends of mine they're all peers who came through exactly the same system as i did um, and I know that they go through exactly the same sorts of, uh, you know, self-criticism, self-doubt. It's very much part of the job, unfortunately, and probably exacerbated these days by social media a bit as well. So, yeah, it's an interesting profession. It's, it's quite sort of lonely in some ways because, you know, not many people understand it. Everybody thinks they can do it uh, and do it better. But let me tell you. Very few can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, talk, talk us through how you review a match and how you keep on improving. What, what do you do after a game to, you know, review what you've just called and then how do you build upon it for the next game? Well, I, you know, I watch games back, obviously. Um, and I'll, it's funny, you know, when the 90 minutes is over, I couldn't tell you a single word of what I've said. <laughs> your, your brain has just been a, a mush. Mm of words for 90 minutes and I can't remember anything. And yet when I go back and watch it on screen on the replay, I can tell you virtually word for word what I said in vital moments of the play. It's very strange how the brain works. Um, But there are, you know, there are periods of play where I'll think, oh, I was was maybe a bit flat there Um, or, you know, my choice of words wasn't perhaps correct. so you, you'll, you know, you'll try and think about, okay, if that situation occurs, and obviously there's a lot of repetition in football, you know, if, if that situation occurs again in the future, maybe I'll try this. And, and of course, you know, I still listen to the other commentators. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of John Champion. Uh, I think his economy of words is, is absolutely magnificent uh, as, a, yeah. as a broadcaster. But it's slightly different as well f- for John and for the other guys in England because – you know, every week they have 30, 40, 50,000 crowds behind them, which makes yeah. a big difference. Now, we don't necessarily have that every week here in the A-League. So, you know, it's a slightly different style of commentary. and Obviously, there's a different style of play as well. So there are, there are little adjustments that you have to make. Um, and just even in an Australian sense, you know, I remember when I arrived here in 2003 uh, listening to a rugby league game, and I didn't watch a lot of rugby league when I was in the UK, and after 20 minutes, I, th- I thought my ears were going to bleed. Um, you know, they literally shouted <laughs> the entire 20 minutes. Uh, and there was, you know, without taking a breath. Now, uh, that's not my style. I don't think it's a football style generally. But there's a bit of that that sort of creeps in because the Australian audience is used to that. So you have to sort of find a bit of a halfway house. of mm. Talking perhaps a little bit more than I did in the UK but not quite talking as much as the rugby league and AFL guys do and certainly not being as, as shouty. But it's a, it's an awkward balance. I, I've likened it on several occasions to you're, you're the driver of a, a car with a wobbly wheel and you're trying to keep it in the middle of the road and it keeps trying to veer off to the left or the right and you've got to keep yeah. you know correcting it um, and, and keep the narrative flowing. Uh, which is not easy to do in coherent sentences for 90 minutes, you know, watching a game that can unfold in a thousand different ways. So it's particularly you've got producers in your ear and you know, pictures being changed and you've got to get advertisers and sponsors away and drinks breaks and ad breaks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's, a bit, it's a very multi-layered job. And uh, at the end of it, you come home and um, you're pretty cream cracked, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I, hadn't, um, I hadn't thought about the impact that a crowd 
can make on the commentary because you mentioned John Champion there. Like in the Premier League, it's almost like that's a point of reference for him to speak about. Like say, you know, at Liverpool, for instance, you know, it's going absolutely manic. So like at any point he can reference what the crowd's doing. And you're right, like here's no, you don't get that as much. Yeah, not just reference it, but also uh, his cadence can be um, in sync and in rhythm with that crowd. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't have to, if, if uh, you know, Sadio Mane scores a worldie from 30 metres, he doesn't have to scream and shout all over the top of that because the crowd's doing it for him. Yeah. Now, if, if that goal is scored in the A-League, for example, between a game between, you know, the Mariners and Wellington, <clears throat> no disrespect to either club, but there might be 5,000 there. So in some ways, the commentator has to drive that emotion um, yeah. because the crowd is not there to, to make it into that special moment that it is undoubtedly. So it, it's, you know, again, it, it's a matter of making little adjustments for the competition you're calling and the conditions you're calling it in. And, uh, you know, the, the Premier League guys are fantastic at what they do. They wouldn't be there if if they weren't at the very top of their game. As I say, I know most of them, uh, they're friends of mine. But, you know, they do have that added bonus of having that noise, which yeah. gives them such a brilliant backdrop. Mm. It's also what they, almost what they don't say. Like sometimes they just say something yeah. very simple. Correct. And that it just fittingly, you know, yeah. it explains what's happened because the crowd is going crazy and you've got that background noise. Like so, well, I, I feel like sometimes if they just, if you reduce what you say, it almost has a bigger impact, which is, well, you know, if you, if you put that on in the A-League, it yeah, wouldn't have the impact. In journalism is, or in certainly sports broadcasting, if you've got nothing to say, say nothing. Uh, and one of the best exponents of that art in Australian terms was Richie Benno. Um, mm he would say nothing for minutes on end. I'm not sure he'd get away with that today, to be honest. Maybe <laughs> people respected him. But, um, you know, these days you're expected to talk, uh, you know, a fair bit more. But I, mm. I always recount the story um, watching I, – I hosted the Ashes, you might remember, for SBS in 2005. Mm. And as part of that series, England, of course, were very worried about the late uh, Shane Warne. Um, so they got the, the bowling machine called Merlin to try and replicate his, you know, different deliveries for the batsmen to practice against. And Simon Hughes, who was the bowlologist, that's what he was called during that series, gave us this brilliant, fascinating breakdown as to how this machine worked and all the technical whiz bangery that went into it. And at the end of it, they cut back to the wide shot of, of the oval and there was about a five-second silence before Richie Bano picked up and he just said, hmm... But has it got a brain? <laughs> <laughs> I just thought was absolutely magnificent. Um, you know, and he just timed it perfectly, gave mm, it yeah. enough of a pregnant pause. That's that's top quality broadcasting. Yeah. And just to add an example to what you're talking about, how in the A-League, the commentators perhaps have to need to add a bit more of their own emotion and elation to kind of really capture the moment. Brenton Speed did that beautifully when Riley McGree scored that scorpion kick couple of years ago and it probably needed something like that to really showcase how good of a goal it was which i think got nominated for a pushkas award that year as mm. well yeah. um yeah. but um you're right it's interesting how there's that difference between the epl and the alia and the a league um just a, you mentioned richie Benno. just between different codes what what are some of the nuances of football commentating that differ from say commentating an afl match which is quite fast paced or, or a cricket match which is extremely slow uh, well, look, I can't speak for AFL because, to be brutally honest, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't watch it, so I'll have to let that one through to the keeper. Uh, cricket, of course, and I've done cricket commentary myself in the UK many years ago. Uh, cricket is, is a very different form because, it, as you say, it's a much slower game. There are, there are lots of breaks. So there, there are opportunities to develop conversations, and not always about cricket. I mean, if you've ever listened to test match special on the BBC. Could just be they talk about cake for about half the day, <laughs> um, and, and you know the best uh, the best red wines. Um, <clears throat> so I think I think cricket is a a sport that lends itself to that because uh, that there's a lot of time. You know, I mean, the game itself goes on for five days, or at least a test match does. Uh, whereas football, you've got everything compacted into ninety minutes. So uh, expanding upon 
conversation points is not only sometimes difficult, but also rather unnecessary, which of course is what the pre and post game shows are there for as well. And, and the halftime chat. Um, I, I think that, you know, we, we, we need to focus largely there, there is occasionally space to, you know, develop a point And, you know, we try and do that, particularly with Andy Harper, who I've, I've worked with for many, many years, but, you know, largely during that 90 minutes, you are focused on the play. Um, and football, you know, it's a pretty fast moving game. You can be up one end, you know, one minute and then down the other, the next, and it has a flow to it that some of the other sports, don't, particularly cricket. So you've got to focus on, on, on the play that unfolds in front of you. And to be honest, I prefer that. I think, you know, the 90 minutes uh, at a weekend, that's sacred. That's when you focus pretty much mm. entirely on the football. The rest of the week is when you talk about the issues. Mm, yeah. um, fortunately, we don't talk about the issues too much during the week at the moment because there aren't enough journalists there, but that's uh, a separate point. <laughs> so I want to test your memory and take you way back to that uh, Australia versus Uruguay match we referenced at the start. Not this again. <laughs> <laughs> we'll focus outside of the 90 minutes. Um, Bruce McAvaney, he's notorious for his preparation for the Olympics. He can reel off just about any stat at any time. Um, and we spoke to Hamish McLaughlin previously in the podcast and he told us that Bruce will sometimes get only three hours of three hours of sleep a night because he's busy studying. We were wondering, what were you doing to prepare for that match against Uruguay in 2005? Well, it was a bit different for me in 2005 because, of course, largely I'd done all my preparation for the two teams because they played in Uruguay in the first leg four days prior. So all the knowledge of the two squads and that preparation on the players had been done. It was just a matter of, you know, updating certain bits of information. So for the second leg, it, it was pretty straightforward. Prior to that, of course, I, I'd had to do a lot of work in, you know, finding out particularly about the Uruguayan players. Obviously I knew about some of their biggest stars, uh, Alvaro Recoba, uh, Diego Lugano, Ricardo Morales, uh, the goalkeeper, Fabian Carini, um, their, their coach, Jorge, what was his surname, Fossati. Um, goodness me, I can still remember all these names, <laughs> 18 years or whatever it is. So, you know, all, all that work had been done. Uh, the bigger problem for me on that particular night was the fact that I'd only flown in from Uruguay, I think, 48 hours prior, and I was jet-lagged and tired and um, obviously, you know, knew it was a big game. Uh, trying to get sleep when you're jet lagged is not easy. I was aware of the magnitude of you know w what was about to unfold and what it meant had Australia got there. So, yeah, you know, the, different games bring uh, different stresses, and you know, in general, for preparing for matches, it, it will depend on the difficulty of the teams in terms of preparation that, that you're covering. I mean, for example, during the Asian Cup in 2019. Uh, you know, I think I did 10 games in 12 days, um, including nations like North Korea, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Vietnam. So, you know, those players are obviously not hugely familiar to any of us here in Australia. So they require uh, an awful lot of research and it's hard work. It's enjoyable work. Uh, I, I love it personally because I'm a football nerd and I love also learning about different cultures through football. Um, so I'm fascinated by it, but it's, you know, it's pretty full on. Um, and then, you know, once you've got all that information, you've also got to translate it into the 90 minutes and try and get the pronunciations right as well. And let me tell you, with, you know, some teams like Vietnam, that is hellish difficult. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, there, there can be other things that you have to do outside of actually preparing you know, the football side of things, for example, when Australia played Vietnam recently, which they did in Melbourne, and I was calling the game, uh, I went down to my local laundrette, which, as luck would have it, is run by a, a lovely Vietnamese couple, and, and literally asked them to um, record 25 names phonetically with the pronunciation, which they were good enough to do. Wow. Um, you know, you've got to go away and try and practice it. And you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get every single one right every single time. Uh, but I think you're duty bound to make an effort. I think that shows respect uh, to the opposition. Um, we would expect it for our players. So why shouldn't we do it for our opponents? Is the rest of your preparation, does that 
is that simply a case of, you know, Googling the players on the team, the coaches, and finding out past articles and interviews that they've done? Or what does your research look like? Yeah, look, it's part of it. Um, you know, certainly with players you don't know, you'll do Google search, you might do Google Translate. <clears throat> you will look at YouTube video clips, you might get DVDs. Um, I've had that, you know, sent through before by by Football Australia, who are pretty good with us, because obviously, they're, you know, they're our broadcast partner as well. Uh, fortunately, these days, um, with Asian teams in particular, because we've been in Asia for so long now, which is what, 2000 Six, we played our first game, so that's 16 years. A lot of these teams are, are much more familiar to us now, and you know, certainly for us as broadcasters. Uh, and you know, when I when I call Australia, Japan, which I will do in a couple of weeks' time, you know, a lot of those players I'll have called two, three, four times before, if not for the national team, then in the Asian Champions League as well for their club side. So, you know, they're, they're much more familiar. The, the world is a smaller place than it used to be. Uh, you know, when I started in, in broadcasting and, and sports commentary, uh, and goodness me, this shows how long ago it, it was, 90, the early 90s, uh, we used to have the, the Rothmans football yearbook to, you know, cross-check facts and stats. And I would call the football clubs and ask them to fax over 10 <laughs> of the players you know that, that's how basic the technology was um so these days really it's it's a breeze you know everything's at your fingertips you just got to search for it yeah wow the, the, get, getting the info <laughs> faxed through is pretty yeah. handy it's a great time to be a football commentator facts yeah. are everywhere it's, perfect. <laughs> well, it's easier in some ways it's it's more difficult than others because of course everybody else has got access to that information as well so mm. you know you get it wrong they'll let you know about it yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can also broadcast yourself anywhere you want these days too. So there's nothing holding anyone back. Exactly. That's true. That's what we're doing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, Don't get paid for it. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, just going back to your career as a whole, who are the most influential people that have had a positive impact on your career? Is it someone like a, a Les Murray early on or is it you know someone like Martin Tyler, for instance, over in the UK? <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing, but again, they're two very typical Australian answers. <laughs> <laughs> Is that that because yeah. we, we don't know all the, the the nitty like every single commentator over there? Like Martin Tyler's yeah, just the one everyone knows. Look, you know, Martin, uh, you know, I know Martin a bit as well, and Martin is a fantastic commentator. I'm, I'm not being disrespectful to Martin, um, but uh, yeah, my idols growing up were very different, and uh, probably people that you know you haven't heard of in Australia because it's a different generation, it's a different country. So, uh, if I, if I had a, a commentary idol, it would be a guy called Brian Butler. Uh, who was a radio commentator on the old BBC Radio 2, which later became Five Live, which I then went to and worked for. Um, and him in tandem with another guy called Peter Jones, in, in my childhood in the 70s and 80s, you know, they used to travel all around Europe in the days before modern satellite hookups and uh, call big European matches. Um, and I would listen to them on my, on my radio, basically. So, you know, they were the guys that I idolized and thought oh, these guys have such a great life and you know are so good at what they do brian potter in particular i think a it was his voice um but b he, he had a, a very sort of flowery way with words he was sort of like peter drury of, of a bygone age you know that that sort of very descriptive way of, of bringing a football match to you so i, I loved brian butler um, he was certainly, you know, my favourite. I mean, there, there, there were others um, in TV terms, of which, you know, Martin would, would have been one that I would say he's very, very good. Um, but he, he was one of probably a handful. There was John Motson, there was Barry Davis, there was Brian Moore on ITV. There were regional commentators like uh, Hugh Johns, Jerry Harrison, Gerald Sinstat, because I lived in the north of England. He was on Granada TV, which is our local TV up there. Um, so they were all guys that, you know, you, you sort of uh, absorb bits from. Um, Les, I, I'll be, you know, be brutally honest, before I came to Australia, I'd never heard of Les. Um, I only became aware of him through reading Johnny Warren's book, which I did before I came to Australia. I'd sort of heard of Johnny a little bit, um, but obviously coming from the UK, you know, the, those memories weren't uh, at, the, at the forefront of my mind. Um, so I only really met Les when I, when I came to Australia, and obviously he was my 
you know, boss at SBS. And, uh, yeah, it done, obviously done fantastic things. I worked with him for, you know, three or four years uh, before I moved on to Fox Sports. But, uh, no, my, my idol was was Brian Butler. And in a written sense as well, a guy called Hugh McIlvenny, if you've ever read any of his stuff, uh, given that I wanted to be a written journalist, again, just a, an absolutely brilliant writer. Is there one piece of advice or lesson that you recall from anyone you've worked under that still sticks with you today? Um, yeah, that's a good question, actually. Yeah, I don't know whether there's one piece of advice. I, I think it's an overall work ethic to try and be the best you can. Um, that's what I probably absorb from different people. Uh, you know, there, there's no, same as in any other industry, there's no shortcut to success. You have to work at it. Um, you have to do your research. You can't skimp on your research. I did, when I was a young commentator and, you know, I was like 20 years, early 30s, and I was still in the, you know, going out to the pub on a Friday night and having a few beers and, you know, that, that sort of uh, typically British lad lifestyle and it was there was the odd occasion where i would skimp on the research or i'd be a bit hung over the next day and it, it showed you know in in commentary it's, it's like you know trying to play a game when you've had one too many the night before you can do it but you're not right at the top of your game uh, and i learned that pretty pretty early on that it, you know if, if i wanted to to be at the top and if i wanted to continue doing it even you know i had to dedicate myself to it um and I wanted to anyway because I, you know, I love football. It's it's always been my life from being a kid. Um, and if I wasn't working in it, I'd be going and watching it at a weekend anyway. Um, and I'm sorry to say this. I know people get upset in Australia because it's a little bit different here. But you know, everybody says, "Oh, you know, I just love sport." Well, I don't actually. I just love football. I'm not really that big a fan of the other sports. I like a bit of cricket, but um, you know, I don't watch Aussie Rules. I don't watch rugby league. I don't watch rugby union. Um, the other sports really don't hold that much interest for me. <laughs> um, it's always been all about football. So, you know, that's that's why this is the best job in the world for me anyway. And it's given me everything. And, uh, you know, hopefully I've given a bit back. And um, I, I try to do that by working as hard as I possibly can and um, being as honest as I possibly can in my views and my, in, on my cause. And you don't get everything right, obviously, but uh, hopefully people you know, see that and, and respect it. And by and large, certainly in Australia, I've been very fortunate. People have been fantastic with me here. Well, it sounds like that love of football finally took over the uh, love of the Friday night beers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but the drums remain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm still hoping at some point that I'm going to be a rock star as well. But I might, <laughs> There's I still might time. <laughs> yeah, always time for a career change. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Simon, let's talk football because football is your life. Um, it, it seems like football in Australia is always a, a huge talking point. You know, everyone's, I feel like before every season, it's like, you know, when's the A-League going to take off? I feel like the question's been around for years and years. How do you see the current state of the game in Australia, and what does the you know the new broadcast deal with Network Ten and Paramount do for the A League's competition? Oh, how long have we got here? This, this might be another hour. <laughs> um, look, you know, the A Leagues and it is plural these days, obviously with with the men's and women's competition mm. uh, are in unfortunately you know one of its regular states of flux. Um, we're in a big downwards curve at the moment. Now, there, there are many reasons for that. Obviously, a uh, you know, three-year governance war in, during which time, in my opinion, at least the, the domestic competitions were horribly neglected by everybody concerned. So we're in a rebuilding phase, which has been also hampered by COVID. Uh, we've got some structural issues, I think, with some of the clubs. You know, we've admitted a club in Western United on the basis of them building a stadium and three years down the line, we're, we're still waiting for them to lay a brick. Um, that's just one example. We've got Wellington Phoenix playing in Australia in, uh, you know, in Wollongong. We've got Perth who's been away from WA for three or four months. We've got Brisbane playing an hour outside of the city. We've got Sydney playing away from the Sydney Football Stadium. It, you know, there, there's a lot of displacement in this league and I, I, I think the fans are a, a little bit confused 
and probably a little bit um, tired of some of the promises, to be honest. I think, I think it's time that the game started delivering. Uh, you know, this constant talk about metrics, have to deliver on the metrics. Well, when's it going to happen? needs to happen soon. The fans are there, and I think they'll come back, uh, you know, once the once the league gets its act together. But at the moment, it's, it, it's a little bit of a mess, um, and it needs to be resolved. Probably won't be this season, to be honest, but certainly next year, uh, we've got to start seeing some green shoots of recovery because at the moment, you know, it's just simply not good enough. In terms of the, the TV deal, obviously this is a long-term build. Uh, it's a five-year contract with big investment, not just in uh, the competition, but in the, the the APL itself by Network 10. So, you know, I can only speak as I, as I find and you know, 10 have been fantastic with me. I know they're committed to it. Um, but it's, it's not going to be fixed overnight because, as I mentioned, there's a, there's a lot of issues that, that need attention. Um, and, you know, there's some issues with, with the broadcast app as well. I'm not speaking out of turn by saying that. Um, we've got some issues to sort out as well. So it's, we're in a difficult moment again, um, which is unfortunate. It seems to be these regular peaks and troughs, boom and bust, boom and bust. We've got to get out of that cycle. But... Um, First, we've got to get out of the bust and into the boom and uh, then try and keep it there. And we're, we're a fair way, up, way off that at the moment, unfortunately. What's the uh, the most immediate issue that needs fixing in your mind? Well, I would, once upon a time, I would have said money, but they've just got a big investment from Silver Lake to the tune of $130 million. So, you know, along with the TV deal, you'd hope that there's a, there's a bit of cash in the back pocket. I, I think the stadiums are a big issue, to be honest. Um, you know, having so many teams that are displaced um, from where they should be, uh, you know, that, that, that's a massive problem for me. If you don't know where your team's playing, that's pretty fundamental. Mm. Uh, and th- this stat, and I'll quote this stat a few times, which I think speaks volumes for the A-League as a, as a whole. During the course of the journey since it started in 2005, and we've had, of course, what is it, 14 clubs or 15 if you include New Zealand Knights, um, we have had, we have played at over 50 stadiums. Wow. 50. Wow. That's for 15 clubs. Really, that number should be 15. At most, it should be 30, 35. And yet we're all over the place. Ballarat, Tasmania, Cairns, Mudgee. Um, you know, how, how do we expect the fans to follow this? Mm. Fans need places to go and worship every fortnight. They need places to call home. They need very uh, uh, visible symbols of why they should belong to that football club. And at the moment, I just think, you know, a lot of our clubs, not all, but a lot of our clubs are just like flotsam and jetsam floating around the country. And, you know, the fans are... Are disconnected from it. It's, I think it's a pretty fundamental thing about football. You know, we, we talk about the great clubs of world football. You, you mentioned Liverpool, Ryan, a while ago. You know, where does Liverpool play? Anfield. Everybody knows that. Yeah. Everyone who knows anything about football knows that. Where do Manchester United play? Old Trafford, Real Madrid, the Bernabeu. You know, th- these are iconic homes of football. And you, when you go there, you feel as though you're walking into the home of that football club. And you feel it because you are. Mm. And there are visible symbols. There are, you know, um, statues of former players. There are pictures of trophy wins. The whole stadium is in the colours of that particular football club. We have none of that here. Nothing. Mm. Even when Sydney FC go back to the Sydney Football Stadium, which they will do next year, it's going to be a beautiful stadium. But I can tell you what it'll look like. I will park my car up in the Sydney Cricket Ground Trust. I will turn right at Rugby League headquarters. I will dip my lid to the Sydney Roosters and round the corner is the Waratahs and there will be Cricket New South Wales on the right. Uh, the, uh, the merchandise store will have the Sydney Swans jumpers alongside the Sydney FC. And if we're lucky, we might get a couple of flags up saying Sydney FC. And the pitch will have rugby league markings all over it for half the year. You know, these are the things that football fans don't enjoy. They want to feel a sense of belonging if they're going to support that team on a regular basis. And I'm not saying they're easy things to fix because we live in a country where, you know, we share stadiums left, right and centre. Yeah. But 
it, it, we've got to do better than what we're doing at the moment. We can't keep taking games to big cricket ovals with 60,000 capacities um, and seagulls flying everywhere and, and, and expect you know people to turn up in big numbers. It's simply not going to happen. There's a reason why Cooper Stadium in Adelaide is so good. It's a proper football stadium. And they only play there, don't they? No one else. The stands are close to the pitch. It's red and white. You feel as though you're in Adelaide and that you're at the home of Adelaide United because you are. Um, We need more of that. Simple. It's, Mm. It's interesting what you say about how belonging has got such a big thing to do with drawing fans to the game. I think when you look at English football and you look at the communities that they have surrounding these big clubs, it's quite infectious and you know i look at those clubs and think how do we create that in australia what role do you think uh clubs have in facilitating the community of the of their fandom um or is that something that you know perhaps is left to the cheer squad or or the fans where do you think the clubs sit in in that no it's it's absolutely vital that they connect with their communities particularly as they are franchises let's be honest that's what they are and they're pretty new, so they don't have a lot of history to be able to draw on. Um, so you've got to get out in your community and make them feel a connection to your club. Now, those symbols that I talked about, they're, they're just physical representations. They're massively important, but just as important as the emotional bonds that you form with your club. What we have to do is try and engender generational support. Now, you see, I'm wearing my Man City jumper here, and that's because my dad was a Man City fan, my granddad was a City fan, my great-granddad played for them in 1892. It's been handed down to me. I didn't choose to be a Man City fan. It was chosen for me, and I was taken to my first game when I was six years of age and rolled as a junior blue and basically said, that's your team like it or lump it. I mean, I could have changed. I could have fought against it, but I didn't. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's true of a lot of football clubs and their fans around the world. Now, unfortunately, we've not been very good at retaining the fans that we got. And remember, it's only a few years ago since we had 62,000 for Sydney Derby, 43,000 in Melbourne Derby. The fans are there and they have connected with this league at various points. But we have not been good enough um as a sport at retaining those fans. And partly that's because we didn't understand the nature of active support, which grieves me to today. We killed it off. Well, not me personally, but the powers that be um, through trying to appease the mainstream. We should have told the mainstream where to get off. They don't care about our game. You've got to sell to football fans first and foremost. And I think we've been reaching for the stars and tripping on the stairs. We've got to sell to our own people first. They understand the game, they love the game, and they support the game in that unique way which makes it so intoxicating. Forget about the mainstream. If we make our product good enough, they'll come along through curiosity anyway, which they did. Mm. So it, it's it's about that you know authenticity of, of football experience, and we haven't been good enough. We've done it in places throughout the last 15, 20 years, but we haven't followed it through consistently because we've been too nervous about what the mainstream thinks yeah that's just that's just reminded me of uh when perth glory played sydney fc in the grand final a couple years ago they've played at hbf park all year and then they moved the game to perth stadium (laughs) and and we lost that was for the grand final for the grand final and well, it's like, it's, look, I think, sorry, Ryan, but I think to be fair, a grand final is a little bit different because that is the showpiece event. And obviously there would be so many people wanting to go there. Um, they had to, because it only holds, what is it, 19, 18, yeah. 19, it was an HBF park. So they had to go to the big stadium. But but I, I completely take your point that ideally yeah. it should be an HBF park, but then you would have disappointed about 40,000 people. Yeah. Like, I, I get it, you know. I, I understand commercially it's great, but it's also just unusual. Like that, yes. that wouldn't happen in the Premier League. They're not going to take the, you know. Grand finals don't happen in the Premier League. Yeah, but like, you know what I mean? If, if there was a grand final there, Man City's playing at home if they make it, you know, like. Or they've got, got changing they've got the Wembley. last minute. Yeah, yeah purpose built for that. Wembley for the cup final, you know, that, that's neutral territory. Um yeah, look, it's a different landscape here, and you, you do have to make allowances for that. Um, 
But yeah, I, I take your point that really, the, you know, Perth's identity should be wrapped up with HPF Park. And to be honest, Perth is one of the better clubs, yeah. you know, with that because that is a proper football stadium. Yeah. Um, and again, it, you know, it, it's a proper football stadium because of the vision of a football person 20 years ago, Nick Tanner, who converted it from Perth Oval into a proper football stadium. Yeah. That's what needs to happen. Um, but we are investment shy in this country in football terms. We want everybody else to pay for everything. Mm. Uh, instead of working in partnership with you know with governments and, and business, but anyway, as I said, that that's a chat that could go on for about five hours. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Simon, it's absolutely fascinating. You're right. We yeah. could talk at length about that and how the different ways the A League can start to emulate the uh, communities of world football. Um, we might start to to wrap it up. And for those listening who are interested in uh, thinking of a career in football or thinking of a career in commentary what what's your best piece of advice for those looking to get into the industry hmm. uh, at the moment it's very difficult even to get in the media has changed um not for the better in my opinion uh, obviously we have the technological revolution which means that audiences are now fragmented and that means that broadcasters can't get the returns that they once did through advertisers and sponsors so, you know, we're dealing with an industry now that is very much diluted financially from what it once was and accountants run the show. So, you know, jobs are at an absolute premium, particularly paid jobs. Um, so if you want to get into it, the only advice I can offer, and I do this quite a bit, is work as hard as you possibly can. Um, do your research, try and get as much experience as you possibly can. That probably means doing unpaid work. Um, and if you're good enough at some point, somebody hopefully will give you an opportunity. Uh, and I do still think that that applies, to be fair. If you've got talent, it'll be recognised. However, my caveat to it is have a backup plan because, you know, journalism these days is, is becoming increasingly difficult in general to make a living out of. I've been very fortunate. I've had three quarters of my career and hopefully a bit more to come yet, but um, in paid employment. But I'm not sure the next generation is going to have that because the money just is not there. People don't want to pay for media these days. They think it should come for free. Um, and, you know, that's the sad reality. And the industry has not been good enough or clever enough to be able to figure out a way of, uh, you know, getting enough money to, to pay for the services that we provide. But we all still have bills to pay, mortgages to pay, mouths to feed. Um, but, yeah, that, that's the sad reality mm. of the modern-day industry. But, you know, th there will be opportunities for some. As I say, work hard, do your research, try and learn, try and get experience. Um, keep knocking on the doors if you're determined and hopefully if you've got talent you get an opportunity but have a plan b mm. you're right it's getting harder than ever to break into the uh the media game for those who are looking for opportunities to start uh getting some experience in that space we mentioned earlier you know with the birth of social media anybody can broadcast themselves anywhere there's a whole lot of grassroots clubs around the entire country who i'm guessing don't have their matches filmed or commentated so I reckon a club president would be pretty happy to hear you wander up to them and say, hey, I've got a camera, I've got my own microphone, let me commentate your games for 90 minutes a week. You can keep the recordings, you can analyse the footage, you can even hear me say a few funny things about your players and make heroes of them at the mm. same time. And I'm guessing someone will appreciate your initiative at some point in time. So do with that what you will. <laughs> Yeah, look, that's the, you know that's the benefits of technology as well. Is that uh, you know we can all become amateur cameramen and uh, commentators and broadcasters um, and and learn literally on the job. Um, so you know the MPL system now has its own broadcast deal. So you know that, I think that goes pretty deep down the pyramid here in Australia. But I'm sure there are grassroots clubs, you know, or even amateur clubs that would be uh, more than happy to have their Sunday league or Saturday league fixture, you know, filmed and, and commentated. And it's a good way of uh, of learning how to do the job uh, at a very basic level. Um, to be honest, in some ways, you know, I wish I'd had that when I was starting out. But obviously, we didn't. You know, we didn't have that technology back in the early nineties. We, you know, we were still sending carrier pigeons and sending smoke. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there, there will be opportunities for you know 
good, talented young professionals, but um, they're just not quite as plentiful, unfortunately, as they used to be. Finally, Simon, uh, the big question uh, on our minds at the moment is, are we going to qualify for the World Cup? And how do you think we're going to go against Japan uh, in a couple of Thursdays' time? Uh, I, I think it's 50-50, to be honest. I, I oh, think no. two games to come against Japan and Saudi are, are obviously huge. They, they've basically got to win both, I think. Maybe four points might be enough, but I, th- I think they've got to win both. I think that's very, very difficult. I think they'll finish third. And then it's about the playoffs. Um, at the moment, I think it's UAE in the Asian playoff, which is no gimme, particularly as it's going to be, I think, a one-off in Doha, which you know would favour the UAE. Mm. Um, and if we get through that, then it's the fifth-place South American team. Now, again, I think, and I, I stand to be corrected on this, but I think it's Uruguay at the moment. And we know how difficult that is. So, um, you'd, yeah. you'd be calling that though. I would have thought you'd well, be excited. I, I, Maybe I, get Foz. Five if I do. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I think it's it. It's in the balance. I, yeah. I, I don't know if Australia are going to qualify. To be brutally honest, uh, and on current results, you've got to say that's fair. You, you know that yeah, World Cups shouldn't be easy to qualify for. We shouldn't expect to get to the World Cup every single time. Big nations have missed out. England have missed out. Italy mm. have missed out. Italy, yeah. Italy missed the last one, didn't they? Yeah. The European um, champions. It happens. And what normally happens uh, when that occurs to a big football nation is they have a, a big period of introspection and go, we've got to sort this out because this is important. And it might not be a bad thing in some ways. You know, it would be devastating and damaging for our game here, but it might just ring a few alarm bells with people to say, hey, we, you know, we've got to do things a lot better here because, you know, maybe maybe qualifying for the World Cup every four years, as we've done for a long time now, has papered over, a, you know, quite a few cracks. Mm. Um, and that, that a lot of countries in Asia have either overtaken us or are catching up to us very fast. And I'm not just talking about Japan and Saudi or, you know, one or two of the others, South Korea. Yeah, I'm talking about, you know, the likes of Vietnam, um, uh, Thailand, they're investing huge amounts of money in their football and they've got talent and they've got bigger populations than we do. So, you know, we, we've got to get with the program. We still exist on the smell of an oily rag in this country and it's got to change. But, you know, I don't know whether it will because people here seem perfectly content to, you know, throw money at Aussie rules and rugby league um, when they have no international significance, which for me is odd, but, you know. I, I don't. I wasn't born here, so maybe that's easy for me to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. They don't have international, so it's it's uh, it's probably a fair point. But um, Simon, it has been awesome chatting to you, uh, chatting to Ruben p- before you, you got on. I was like, I can't believe uh, Simon Hill's jumping on here. Uh, <laughs> you know, growing up seeing you on screen, so it's been absolutely awesome to have you on and and just hearing your journey. Um, over the years, you know, starting from, you know, back in the UK to, to coming over to Australia, um, you genuinely are the, the voice of Australian football. So it's just been great to get your insight and, you know, everything in between. So thanks a lot and uh, good luck for the rest of the season and we'll looking forward to your call at the next World Cup qualifier. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks for having me. All righty, Rubes, what an episode. What a man. Uh, that was actually that cool. <laughs> I, I mentioned in that episode how we grew up seeing Simon Hill on the TV, and it was mm. just it was just unusual to see him in the podcast arena. It was oh, crazy, mate. I reckon I've watched that highlight of John Aloisi a thousand <laughs> times. the The documentary November sixteen, all about that match as well, is one of my favourite um, movies, documentaries, whatever you want to call it. So to actually meet him in person uh, mm. or over the, over the screen was, uh, was phenomenal. But, um, Ryan, one of the things I'm taking away from talking with Simon, uh, relates to his opinions on the state of Australian football. So if you're in Clubland, one of Simon's real points was how can you help people belong to the club? He feels like a lot of the administration mm. there needs to do more to help people feel like they can belong. And so I think that's a really important thing for people to to think about whether they're working in the industry or uh, want to work in the industry in the future. Think about ways you can help people belong. 
And if you're out in a grassroots club at the moment, it's the same sort of thing. What can you do at your grassroots football club, cricket club, netball club, whatever club it is to help people belong? Because it's the same sort of fundamentals that connect people that apply at any level of sport. And I think particularly if you do happen to have an interview coming up at an A-League club, for example, this is a real talking point that you could bring to that interview. Talk Mm. about the ways that, you know, the club can help people belong so that more fans can become attached to it and the great game can grow. Yeah, I love that. It's, you know, it's probably something we didn't really consider before. You know, we had that question. We wanted to ask him that. We didn't really think... You know, I just thought we were going to talk about the Lee and blah, 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 but I think it, it cuts deeper than that, which, which was mm-hmm. great. So um, one thing I loved was just his point around working hard and not cutting corners. You know, he mm-hmm. referenced back when he was in the UK that, you know, he'd, he'd prepare a little bit, then he'd probably go to the pub with his mates, have a couple of beers, and then, you know, rock up the next day and it might not feel that great. <laughs> um, it's just a reminder, you know, if you want to get to the level that you want to get to, mm. you have to sacrifice something. So, you know... If there is that opportunity where you can work hard or you could go to the pub with your mates in this mm. one time but you know there's an opportunity the next day, work hard every time. Because you can see where you can see what happened when Simon cut that out and he's got to this point to where he's mm. now. So it's just a, a reminder for everybody. And another thing to consider is that people will only take you as seriously as you take yourself. Mm. So if you are cutting out Friday night drinks. You might think that, ah, it doesn't mean that much. I'm not doing anything of any significance. I probably can afford to have a few beers. If you keep cutting that corner every single time, you're going to stay in that level. But if you take yourself seriously and people see you you taking yourself seriously, then their regard for you is going to just be elevated by that. So great point there from Simon. Uh, Number three for me is get out there and commentate a Sunday league match. As Simon said, It's extremely tough to break into the media industry these days, but there are more opportunities than ever to go out and get experience practicing. For example, Ryan, you and I didn't do a journalism degree, didn't grow up practicing media. We just thought we like podcasting. We feel like we've got something interesting to say. Let's do it. Figure out how to use some microphones. Exactly. (laughs) Figure it out and look, create your own podcast, create your own um, match day wrap-ups of your local team. There's so much technology available that allows you to get out and broadcast yourself and just get the reps in and become better at it over time. And uh, yeah, that's been our experience and we can't advocate for that enough. But honestly, all it takes is a little bit of initiative and you're on your way. Yeah, I love that. Awesome. Well, that wraps it up. What an episode that was. Mm. Uh, I love I love the, these these type of things. <laughs> We're seeing people that we grew up watching, like yep. crazy stuff. Anyway, one of those good feel podcasts. Find us on LinkedIn. Plus, be sure to jump into the Sports Rack community. We'd love to chat with you in there. Head to our website to join, or head to the link in our show notes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.